My mother is a highly intelligent woman, as is typical of her generation, she didn't go to university. For her, it was always very important that the female children got an education that was equal to the males. I have two brothers and two sisters, and it, it was always expected that we would go to university and we would do the things she wasn't able to do. I was told I ought to be a lawyer. I was extremely argumentative and competitive as a child, and my parents were convinced that that was obviously the thing I ought to do, because there were no lawyers in my family male or female. Uh, I really had no idea what it meant other than obviously this is the career of somebody who's very argumentative and so that, that's why I pursued it, not with any sense of what the challenges might be or indeed what, what the pleasures of the job might be. I grew up in the countryside so you weren't constantly in a larger society being aware of how it's changing around you. Obviously being at university in the 70s, punk rock, the, the whole idea of there being social change was very apparent but not real until you came to, to confront it yourself in your own life. My first experience of uh, overt sexism and the, real, the realisation it might actually make a difference to what happens to me really didn't come until I, I started trying to, to make my way as a barrister. Tried and failed to get in to places for about two years doing pupillages and being told I wasn't good enough. So when I ended up in a criminal set, there was a real sense of revelation when I did my first case and you just thought it was so exciting to have somebody whose whole life depends on what you do. It was a charge of possession of drugs with intense supply so the guy could have gone to prison. It was pretty obviously something that should have been dealt with by way of a possession charge only, which was much less serious. There was a trial and he was cleared on the supply aspect. He'd already said he was guilty of possession, but he walked away from court very happy. You know, it was just very, very exciting. It's your job mainly to make sure you don't mess his case up, but also to try and sort something out. And, it, and it's fantastically rewarding because you have a problem you see it through to the end, there is a conclusion in court. By the time I started at the bar, I was very much standing on the shoulders of those who'd gone before. As you started work, you had people around you like Barbara Mills, who was at a silk and went on to be Director of Public Prosecutions, Anne Kerno, who'd been in Treasury Council's room. So those you were aware that there were women who'd broken through the barriers, who'd, who'd kicked open some of the doors that you were now going to want to go through. But I can't say that they were role models just simply because, you know, as a junior barrister, you, you're, you're mainly looking at your peers. And, and to be honest, when I was a junior barrister, mainly my peers were male barristers. So there was nothing overt or aggressive about it. But there's no doubt that you were an odd one out. Once I realised that, then I said to myself, well, the only thing I can do is be really, really good at what I do and then I'll be making things better for people who come after me because there won't be that sense of, oh, she looks a bit old, it'll be just, well, she's, she's good, let's, let's take her on. I started with this whole series of cases about the death penalty in the United States in extradition, which led eventually to a case called Suring, which is a really important case in terms of expanding the reach of the European protection for the right to life, preventing people facing the death penalty in the United States. So that's something that happened to me very, very early. Obviously, each case where it turns out well for the individual client, if I'm defending, you know, there's a huge pleasure in having met somebody who's effectively in the, le the legal equivalent of in the grip of a long illness, and you nurse them through and they recover at the end, and they say goodbye to you and say they hope they'll never see you again. You know, that's wonderful. My abiding memory of Pinochet is uh, not what's in the law reports, but the sheer terror of going along to a hearing where you know you're going to face seven uh, law lords. Uh, and I'd be, you know, it's a tremendous amount of work, so you're getting up very early. I, by then I'd had two children, and so I'd always try and get home to see them in the evening, so you'd get up at three or four o'clock in the morning, come in, do your work, and try and get ready for this whole sequence of cases. It obviously um, focused great attention on problems of independence and partiality. Um, it obviously focused great attention on what we do about crimes of universal jurisdiction and how we manage them. But my, my single abiding memory is 
the morning we went to try and set aside the first judgment and the way I was in the corridor outside about to go in and the corridor was very chilly, it was December anyway. And I was thinking, well, actually I could have been a train driver or a bus driver, that would have been better. And then you go into this very uh, chilly committee room uh, and the first hour as I was talking to the judges, I was thinking, they're saying absolutely nothing. And then gradually after, after I'd explained where we were coming from, what the problem was, you could feel it warm. But that whole sequence of moving from terror to mild confidence that at least they weren't going to jail me for contempt for suggesting they'd got it wrong was one that you remember. And then after that, nothing's ever as bad again. So that you do something really difficult, you think, well, this isn't as bad as Pinochet. <laughs> High profile cases, I think, um, present a danger to the barrister because there, there's a sense that you read your press and you um, respond to the scrutiny and that takes your focus off what you should be doing, which is actually convincing the jury or the court or the judges, whoever you are trying to persuade. So our, my reaction is normally just try and block it all out and, and just treat the case as an ordinary case. Success at the bar is actually very, very simple. You read all the papers, you look at the legal issues, you understand the legal issues, you try and set a strategy which makes sure that you don't make any mistakes and if it can be won before the case starts then we'll win it then, if it can't be won till the Supreme Court well we'll win it then but it's, it's really not complicated. I like having clients so in that sense often in defence work you have a much closer relationship with your client although frankly if you're prosecuting Often the investigator is effectively the surrogate client. He's the guy who's put the case together. No, I enjoy, do I enjoy doing both. And, and there are different skills involved. You're slightly freer if you're defending to push the barriers in a way that probably you wouldn't if you're prosecuting because you want to be very conservative when you're prosecuting and you want, and you want to be right. Every time you make a decision, you have to run, run through it if you're prosecuting saying, is this the right thing to do? Whereas if you're defending, you can say, well, I'm not sure whether this is right, but I'm going to ask the judge and he can decide. It's his problem, not mine. The problem with the bar, particularly, is that it is very much a referral profession. You need people to be referring work to you. That's the only way you're going to survive and, and grow a practice. There needs to be a lot of concentration on the people who sent you work before you had children and the people who are going to send you work after you've had your children and come back from whatever maternity leave you're taking. Now, there is a, a limit on what can be done structurally to make that easier. And, and I think it's why we lose a lot of self-employed barristers to employed roles. The answer is you've just got to make your life so it f can deal practically with the demands of having young children who need to get to school, who may fall sick. My husband and I hit upon a division of responsibility which meant that I had much greater freedom to come back to work to, and to be less directly involved. So you have to discuss it in quite a lot of detail before you embark on it. But it means that I've actually been able to enjoy having the children, not just ignore them and have a career alongside it. I definitely did not set out to be a role model, but I definitely set out to be an example to my male colleagues that said, hey, there's nothing wrong with having women as your colleagues, that they will be as good or better than you. My uh, daughters are 20 and 18, and if they had an interest in the law, uh, I probably would encourage them, but I want to be sure that they were sufficiently robust to cope with the good bits as well as the bad. But Otherwise, yes, is this a great job? It's a fantastic job. I can't think of a better one.